Benvenuti a tutte e a tutti a questo evento informativo sulle nuove tecnologie dell'interpretazione. È bellissimo essere in tanti, da tanti paesi, quindi benvenuti in particolare i colleghi che vengono dall'estero. Abbiamo un vero parterre de roi e de reine, diciamo, e quindi do il benvenuto in particolare al nostro presidente Uro Speter a uh, vicepresidente Paco Garcia Urtado, poi abbiamo una vicepresidente che mi fa l'onore di interpretarmi, l'amatissima Jennifer Fernside, e, mm, e, e quindi abbiamo un'alta un rappresentanza degli organi direttivi di AIC Centrale. Do il benvenuto ai nostri illustri relatori che come noi sentiamo sempre dire non hanno bisogno di essere presentati il professor Barry Slaughter Olsen dell'Università di del Middlebury Institute of International Studies, che farà una Lexio Magistralis sullo stato dell'arte nelle nuove tecnologie, e il collega Klaus Ziegler, coordinatore della Commissione Tecnica e Salute di AIC, membro della Task Force on Distance Interpreting e del gruppo ISO. Benvenuti e grazie di essere qui. Un ringraziamento e un saluto particolare poi all'altra relatrice, eh, Marzia Sebastiani. Marzia, fatti vedere. E qui devo contenere il mio entusiasmo, la mia gratitudine per non dare adito a delle voci maligne. Marzia è l'anima, il pilastro di questa manifestazione e eh, è di, una delle, uno dei pilastri di AIC Italia. Grazie Marzia. ma anche Marzia da sola non potrebbe aver fatto tutto ciò, quindi ringrazio Cristina, Giovanna, Luisa, Veronica, Paola e tutti coloro che eh, hanno dato un contributo nella preparazione di questo evento. Ringrazio i volontari che eh, fanno i turni di cabina volontari in gran parte, a un certo punto mi hanno detto Stefano sembri Uncle Sam quando cominciavo a convocare proprio per i turni mancanti, grazie ai colleghi che appunto sono volontari. Un ringraziamento particolare al nostro sponsor tecnico, il gruppo Planet, ringrazio Umberto e Massimo e tutta la squadra di tecnici che ci hanno portato, grazie. Nelle mie note avevo, ringrazio la tesoriera di AIC World, ma ho, ho rimandato il, il ringraziamento al tuo arrivo. Ciao Miki e benvenuta. E ringrazio anche Verso che ha, um, ci ha offerto la rete AIC dedicata, potenziando quindi la nostra rete eh, tecnica. Passiamo adesso a una mia breve introduzione più di atmosfera che di sostanza. Vediamo se funziona. Ecco, questo è Barry Olsen, 70 anni fa. <ride> Infatti volevo dirti di metterti una giacca da militare, mi sono scordato. Questa, era un, questa è Norimberga ed è eh, il Barry Olsen dell'epoca che presentava, 70 anni fa, le nuove tecnologie. Le nuove tecnologie, eh, come vedete, non sempre all'inizio funzionano bene, quindi vediamo uno dei giudici che sembra avere qualche problemino con questa strana cuffia. Cuffia che poi è, è finita adesso, questo è un pezzo da museo nel eh, memoriale di Norimberga. Per le nuove tecnologie ci vuole, come vedete, una certa concentrazione e bisogna vestirsi di rosso per scaramanzia. Qui faccio una pausa, totalmente imprevista, perché, Jennifer, eh, do you feel like coming out of the booth? Perché Jennifer oggi è arrivata con una sgargiante giacca rossa. Che, <ride> che, eccola qua. Ma non è stato concordato. <ride> Qualche diapositiva un pochino più seria. Per non parlare, diciamo, di questioni vicine 
all'interpretazione di conferenza ho preso un esempio di introduzione di nuove tecnologie in ambito sanitario. E eh, questa è una testimonianza che adesso è anonima, insomma è una rivista del settore. E eh, la, la diapositiva parla da sé, l'introduzione delle nuove tecnologie in alcuni casi è stata accompagnata dal desiderio di risparmiare su tutto il fronte, quindi anche risparmiare sul ricorso a interpreti professionisti. L'analisi di questo, questa collega che eh, riporta questa esperienza è appunto che, che l'introduzione di queste nuove tecnologie in ambito sociosanitario non è stata preceduta da un adeguato sforzo di ricerca e da un'adeguata consultazione degli interpreti. Viene anche fatto riferimento a una debolezza molto umana, una certa avidità delle aziende che offrivano questi servizi e che hanno cercato appunto di, eh, di, non di risparmiare sugli interpreti. Dato che siamo qui a Roma, viene in mente no, il detto latino della sacra fames auri, no, la, la maledetta fame dell'oro, no, che in qualche maniera... E dobbiamo sempre no, cercare di prevenire, di capire. Quindi come problemi che furono evidenziati in questo settore la mancanza di ricerca e di consultazione. Noi nel nostro piccolo di AIC Italia speriamo che questo sia uno dei passaggi in cui consultazione e approfondimento possano essere un pochino portati avanti. Questo è un vaso maia. Quindi torniamo indietro, boh. Non, non lo, la datazione esatta non mi è stata data. Questo è un regalo per me prezioso di Dorina Bonatti, sorella di Alessandra Bonatti. Dorina Bonatti è un membro AIC che sta in Messico, che penso che Barry conosca. You, you know Dorina, no? Dorina Bonatti, sì. Alessandra Bonatti è una collega di cabina italiana che sta al, è stata al Dipartimento di Stato. Il marito è archeologo e ha studiato questo vaso. Perché vi, mh, ho pensato di tirar fuori questo vaso che in realtà ho in serbo da un paio d'anni, che aspettavo l'occasione per condividerlo con i colleghi? Vediamo i personaggi, voi lo vedete nella direzione giusta, vedete due personaggi che sono sicuramente dei servi più dei servitori, abbiamo un dignitario, una persona... Adesso non so se, insomma, da, eh, lo, voi lo vedete, da C, il terzo che è seduto parla, c'è un, un dignitario che è lo, il padrone di casa seduto rialzato su questo tavolo e un'altra persona vicino seduta che parla con un pennacchio che finisce in rosso, il rosso non si vede molto bene ma insomma è un pennacchio rosso, quindi due persone che parlano. Quindi la, la persona che ci interessa è il personaggio è il quarto, due in piedi, due seduti, il secondo che è seduto. Nel copricapo vi ho già fatto notare questo pennacchio che in realtà è, come vedete, un eh, pennello che finisce in rosso e che è utilizzato, era utilizzato per scrivere e dipingere e che contraddistingue questo personaggio come artista e persona sapiente, persona colta. Chi è questo personaggio? Ce lo dicono questi due glifi sovrapposti alla fine del pennacchio e mh, non so come si pronuncia in maia, comunque la parola kilam vuol dire interprete rituale, quindi questo era un interprete ufficiale al tempo dei maia. e al tempo dei Maya gli interpreti erano considerati artisti e persone sapienti. L'immagine sotto ovviamente indica il contesto in cui noi ci troviamo, estremamente tecnologico, in cui noi ci troviamo e ci troveremo sempre più ad operare. Questo vabbè, non, non, è, non vuole essere una, una, una conclusione che non può esserci a questa, in questa fase, una, una piccola riflessione, cioè questa giornata, ripeto, dovrebbe essere un momento di un inizio, uno stimolo per la ricerca, 
un inizio di consultazione e un inizio di definizione in comune delle buone pratiche. Anche questa è un'affermazione, come dire, piuttosto banale. Non dobbiamo mai dimenticare che qualsiasi sia il contesto della comunicazione, o dal Maia accucciato di fronte al dignitario, o eh, di fronte a un computer in un hub, l'interprete deve sempre garantire la comunicazione tra i nostri clienti. Non dobbiamo mai dimenticarlo. E direi oggi non dobbiamo dimenticare di tenerci caro il nostro pennacchio rosso. Grazie. Adesso il piacere di dare la parola al nostro presidente Uro Speter. Prego. Grazie Stefano, thank you very much. Cari amici, siccome ci troviamo nel centro congressi Cavour, in via Cavour, mi sento obbligato a leggervi una citazione sul conte Cavour di Dennis Mac Smith. E va così, dica, Cavour aveva una conoscenza imperfetta dell'italiano, preferiva scrivere in francese. I suoi collaboratori dovevano rivedere gli articoli che scriveva per i giornali e il suo segretario soffriva a sentirlo parlare in pubblico in italiano. Ecco, io sono lontano di essere uno Cavour, uh, però farvi soffrire non lo voglio neanche io. So I'll carry on in English with your permission. Thank you very much. First of all, an immense word of thanks to AIC Italia for organizing this event today. As ever, AIC Italia is AIC's vanguard. Forward thinking, passionate, daring, and fearless in pushing the envelope and pushing the boundaries, willing to explore, volunteering endless hours, just like shown by everyone on the brand and visibility team, by AIC Italia throughout its pursuit of uh, before the assembly with all the things brought on by the new legislation in Italy. You are the first ones to make continued professional development an obligation, something I think AIC should seriously consider doing at a global level. So really a word of thanks to AIC Italia from all those aspects. <laughs> Colleagues, the world of interpreting is being revolutionized yet again. What uh, Nuremberg and the shift from consecutive to simultaneous meant for the world of conference interpreting 70 years ago is perhaps what remote or distance interpreting could well mean for us today. Interestingly, some of the founding fathers of AIC offered very apocalyptic visions for conference interpreting as a profession with the onset of simultaneous, only later to go on and become chief interpreters for some of the world's biggest users of simultaneous interpretation. Now, it's for this reason that uh, I think, I firmly believe actually, that we shouldn't see remote solely as a threat, but also as an opportunity. It shouldn't be seen as the ominous nail in the coffin of conference interpreting, as we know it and as we practice it today, but also as perhaps a door to the future, at least in certain segments of our profession. I say certain segments because it certainly can't function everywhere. There are distinctions. Multilingual conference interpreting is one thing, community interpreting is another, medical interpreting yet another. So we, we need to be careful in, in, in saying whether remote works or not in that setting or another. Now we certainly do not have all the answers today. I think we're still struggling actually to agree on definitions, on, on technical standards, issues like manning strength, physical proximity of teams, uh, and so many other issues remain unresolved in terms of an agreed standard as a, or, or a common denominator, if you will. And that is actually why we're here today, to explore, to share, to debate, to debunk myths, to identify perhaps previously undetected problems, and also to point to the serious known problems, to see what may work in a multilingual conference and what perhaps never will. I think AIC has to take the lead in this matter. Whether we like it or not, we have to admit to ourselves that uh, remote is not a future fantasy, it is here, alive and kicking. 
But already back in 1983, AIC was well, well aware of what is coming, and it adopted the first set of technical guidelines for remote interpreting, quoting relevant ISO standards for sound quality and even the minimum permissible screen diagonal, which in 1983 was 45 centimeters or something. Now, few are aware of this exploit of 35 years ago, but I think it's very illustrative also of how much AIC is doing, how much it does, how much it has done, and how little perhaps we all sometimes know about it. I think that's something we need to improve within our organization. As you know, today the Council of Europe has started negotiations with AIC on an agreement uh, governing remote interpretation. The, United, the European Union, excuse me, DG SCIC, has also announced the opening of negotiations in order to extend the use of remote to meetings other than just European summits, to which this regime was exclu exclu exclusive to, I'm sorry, until now. So, out of curiosity, are there any of the two negotiating delegations concerned represented here today? Didn't think so. It goes to show how much more we need to do in terms of communicating within our own organization. In closing, I'm extremely hopeful that this event is among the first of many such AIC events, hopefully leading up to a global event within the next year or so, organized by AIC, and dedicated solely to distance interpreting. A first mention of this was made already at the Joint Advisory Board and Executive Committee meeting in Geneva last July, and I think the time has come now to start working towards that objective. Now, to sign off on uh, Camilo Cavour's words, he said, the man who trusts men will make fewer mistakes than he who mistrusts them. So let's have that confidence, both in ourselves and in one another, and try to avoid the mistake of ignoring the future. Thank you. Grazie Uros. Adesso ho il piacere di dare la parola all'amico Professor Barry Slaughter Olsen per la sua lezione magistralis. Prego Barry. So if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to get things switched over here. That's me. So let's push that back and end. This other. There we go. So that's good. And I need to check one more thing, which that will come up shortly. I think we're good to go. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you have the wonderful opportunity or unfortunate experience to have to listen to me for the next two hours. That's a long time. I have learned, and you've probably heard this as well, that our mind doesn't take in information much past about 45 minutes, and after that we start to get restless. So uh, you will note that I have a fairly active presentation style. Sitting down is actually quite difficult for me when I present. But I will do that for the first little bit here, and a little bit later I will get a uh, wireless microphone so that I can stand up and move around a little bit. So, okay, let's make sure this is working the way it should and we're going to get started. And interestingly enough, we have some technical issues, so bear with us just for a moment. some reason it's not it moving. Work. Nope. I'm not able to it advance the slides. I've attempted, yeah. but it doesn't move them forward. Yeah, it does here.
There we go. Okay. to move it. There we go. Back over there. Okay, we're ready to begin. So, as we uh, start, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit here just for a minute and then we'll get this other mic set up. Um, to preface, there we go, we've got it working, just for you to know a little bit about me. Um, I wear a lot of hats. I am a conference interpreter and have been working as a conference interpreter for some 25 years. I've been training interpreters since 2007 full-time. Before 2007, I was a full-time conference interpreter who trained on the side. And in 2007, I accepted a position at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, where I began teaching and training full time and continued to interpret on the side, you might say. So I've been in that capacity now for the last 12, uh, 11, almost 12 years. Member of IEC, of course. Uh, most of the work that I do is with uh, U.S. government uh, agencies as well as international organizations based in Washington, D.C., and also the private sector when I lived in California, which is a very different animal than what many of us are familiar with here in Europe and also in Washington, D.C. Um, I am concerned about the future of our profession and am quite excited about the opportunities that lay ahead if we know how to take advantage of them and to be able to leverage technology to our advantage and by so doing, increasing the ability of the world to communicate across languages and cultures. That was one of the things that led me to uh, co-found Interpret America, which is um, a small company that uh, works to raise the profile of interpreting. Finally, I am also an entrepreneur and have been involved in the technology space for well over a decade in an effort to push this whole topic forward and to be able to create the kinds of platforms that you're going to be seeing this weekend. Uh, having said that, I think it is important for me to make very clear that I am here speaking for myself. I do not represent any company. I do not represent any organization. The opinions and the observations that I will share with you are mine and have come about from my own personal experience. And so it is in that spirit that I share them with you. So I'd also like to know who's attending today. And to do that, we're going to use some technology. And uh, I'm going to be using a polling platform called Mentimeter. It's a little different than Slido, which is going to be used for some other things. So for those of you who have a, a smart device, I would encourage you to take it out. And uh, you can find the information here. You'll go to www.menti.com. And the number that you see in the yellow dialog balloon, 21, 516 is the number of this meeting. Um, and as we know, the best laid plans of mice and men often come to naught. I had embedded all of this in my presentation on my computer, but since we switched computers, um, I am going to be moving between one window and another. So I'll do that now. 
when you log on, does it take you uh, to a poll question and ask you what your working languages are? If you would fill that out, I am very curious to see what are the working languages that we have in the room today, beyond English and Italian, of course. So just go ahead and take a minute. And while you're doing that, I think I'm going to go ahead and get mic'd using the wireless mic. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, there you go. Should be able to hear me okay. And this is where Stefano and Uros, you may actually like to sit down so that you can see the slides and participate as I'm going to be walking. I think I have from about here over to about here so that those watching on the web stream will be able to see me. Um, I just tend to present much better when I'm able to move around. Lots of, lots of energy. So as you take a look at the screen here, you can see that English, of course, is right there in the middle and dominating. It's not as uh, bright as I would like it to show, but English is definitely the language that is uh, most shared among interpreters here in the room. I would also mention to those of you who are on the web stream that are watching live, you can go to menti.com as well and participate in the uh, polling and the different questions that we'll be doing throughout this session. So I would encourage you to do that because it's a way for us to get more opinions and more information. And it allows you to be connected to us here in the room, here in Rome. And quickly again, for those who may be online, the number is 21516. So we have a lot of languages in here, Portuguese, Russian, Georgian, German, French, English, of course, uh, I think I saw Turkish in there as well. And so we have a number of languages in different markets represented. So now, since I've got to do this, I have to see how I'm going to be able to move, to move that over. There it is. Now, this is another very important question. And the question is, where does the majority of your interpreting work come from? Is it the public or private sector, or is it basically 50-50, a toss-up? Give you a few moments to go ahead and, and fill that out. And you can see live that uh, the private sector seems to be dominating. Give you a couple more seconds here to see if we have any others. We've got more coming in, folks that are watching. Now, some of you may be wondering, why am I asking this question? This question is a very important one, particular as we, particularly as we talk about technology and the way that it's being used for delivering interpreting services. As you know, within the agreement sector, there are strict rules that have been established and agreements that have been very carefully negotiated. In the private sector, not really. In fact, you negotiate almost every job that you take. And it's up to you to decide what the conditions are that you are going to work in. So as you can see here, the majority of folks that are here in the room today and those that may be watching online, the majority of their work comes from the private sector. And that's a significant consideration as we look at the technologies this weekend. Um, the public sector is one that is slower to change. The private sector moves sometimes with breakneck speed, introducing things that either fail or go well. If they fail, they will iterate, improve, and introduce again and keep trying. And so that is why you are going to see a lot of innovation coming from the private sector. But it also can create a lot of challenges for us because we do have requirements, minimum requirements, for us to be able to do our job effectively. 
Okay, so we had about 54. I think we do have some folks online that are participating, so thank you to those of you who are participating online. So I'm gonna switch back over to my slides. And let's see how I'm gonna do this this time. There's the presentation, yes, you can see that. We will go back to Menti a little bit later. So um, please keep your, your smart devices at hand. So we'll switch through that. That was, um, we've gone through both of these. What's our roadmap for the next hour and 40 minutes or so? I want to talk to you about the big picture. And to do that, we're gonna step out of interpreting a little bit and try to understand some of the larger macro trends that are affecting us as well as just about every other profession on the planet today. We'll talk about the types of technology that are out there. I'm going to explain how I have grouped them so that I can understand them as I've been following these technologies over the last decade. We'll talk about remote interpreting or distance interpreting. What is it? How do we define it, etc. And then I want to talk to you about some developments in the market. Not necessarily the market for interpreting, but the market for communication and collaboration. So that you can understand a broader context that we find ourselves in today. And it's going to be up to us, in large measure, what our role will be in the future in this context. I'll look at a list of some current use cases. These will be specific use cases that I have been able to glean from different companies and platforms that are providing distance or remote interpreting services today. Um, and then we'll have a question. Where do we go from here? Talk to you about a lot of information. I'll leave you with a lot of questions, but we have to have that discussion about where do we go from here, which will most likely happen during the coffee breaks and uh, throughout this weekend. So if you're all in agreement, we'll get started. Let's start with the big picture. You'll notice I've included in each one of these sections a quote. I find that quotes can often encapsulate very quickly what it is that we want to say. The first one comes from Charles Kettering. And he said, we should all be concerned about the future because we will have to spend the rest of our lives living there. Let me also start with uh, this quote from, now hold on here one second. Hmm, you know what? This is not my original presentation. These are my previous slides. I do want to share this one with you, but I've got a couple others that I was hoping to share. So I'm going to see if we can find that. I brought in the last one. All right. May have to switch out. Hmm, so that was keynote address. This one is the one from the 18 for the 20. Yeah, that's the old one. And then keynote address, P.S. Olson. No. No, that's not it either. Well, we're just going to have to go with it. And we'll go ahead and start with Klaus. I did have a couple other photos that I'd hope to show you, and maybe we can look at those in a minute. But <clears throat> I think probably several of you here in the room have had the opportunity to work at one of the different iterations of the World Economic Forum here in Europe or in Latin America or Asia. Um, and it's a very prestigious job, wonderful opportunity. Um, but Klaus Schwab has said something that I think really hits the nail on the head. And we are starting to see this in our profession. And that is that change is not going to come in waves like it has in the past. It's coming as a tsunami whose effects will be felt everywhere. You will have to show agility and entrepreneurship to survive the changes coming because it will change everything. In the future, it's not the big fish that will eat the small fish. It will be the fast that eats the slow. You remember what I talked about with the public sector and the private sector? The private sector moves very, very quickly. 
This is one of the challenges that we have where we have traditionally functioned within IEEC on a committee basis, which is how we function now. And being able to have the necessary discussion and dialogue sometimes takes time. But the private sector just continues to move forward faster and faster, trying to iterate and find the right formula to be able to be successful. We could be very well served in taking a lesson from the private sector in that sense and finding ways that we can add celerity to our discussions. So let's see if it's moving again. Now I've got the wrong slide here. Looks like I did it again. Not sure how. There it is. Now it should work. There we go. So there are three processes that I see moving forward. This is the one that probably most of us are not necessarily worried about, but those who know anything about what we do but aren't interpreters think has already happened. That's replacement. How many of you have had people say to you, oh, are you worried that you're not going to have a job next week? Oh. My iPhone can now do that, right? And so the whole concept of replacement is one that I don't think we really need to worry about greatly right now. AI will not be replacing the services that we provide anytime soon. What we do have to understand is how most people perceive what they think technology can do. And we should focus our efforts on getting the message out about what AI can do and what it cannot. And this is an area where there's great work for us to do as well. Where I like to focus my attention, although if I go back to replacement here for just one moment, the one area where I think there has been the most interest and concern within the conference interpreting community is having interpreters removed from the meeting room from the experience where everyone else remains face to face and we are asked to work remotely. That is one scenario where we are being replaced, not by artificial intelligence, but this new modality of providing interpreting is replacing a previously established one where we were physically present at those meetings. But that's just one of the many uh, applications of remote interpreting. Where I like to focus my attention is on expansion. We have an opportunity to expand access to our services and to also make them readily available much faster and at a lower cost. I'm not referring to what our rates are or what we may be charging in terms of our professional honoraria. I'm referring to the ability to bring down the costs of delivery. And this is allowing us to expand access to interpreting. And we're seeing now simultaneous interpretation making its way into areas where in the past it was simply not technically feasible to offer the service. This has a lot of implications for what we are going to be doing in the future and what we're actually doing now. Because in many situations, if you're being asked to interpret an audio conference that goes for 45 minutes, it's very difficult to say, I'm going to charge a day rate. And so often clients are looking for other ways to be able to purchase these services and be able to retain our services. The next one is convergence. This is huge when it comes to software and the delivery of services in new ways. We've now been in the app economy for over a decade. Just about everyone has a smartphone. There are some that still have flip phones, and there are some people who still do not carry mobile phones at all, but they are a very small minority. How many apps have you downloaded onto your phone? 10, 
20, 30, 100, others you've had to eliminate. Apps that have come and apps that have gone. If you think back just five to seven years ago, even maybe as far back as 10, there were a number of new services and new abilities that came online that were frankly, at the time, amazing. There were a number of services, there was one called Type With Me, that allowed you to actually share a document and people in different parts of the world could connect and they could all collaborate and they could type on that document together. And you could see who was making what changes. And now you're all saying, but that, yeah, you can do that in just about any online document service, Google Docs, any of that. It's become so normal that we don't even think about it. Back then, it was amazingly cutting edge. There were several services that were doing just that. Some got bought up, others stopped their service, and everything just got folded into a larger platform. This is happening, this convergence is happening in many, many areas of our economy. If you look at what we do and the way we provide our services, if you think about what is happening in, for example, in medical interpreting, particularly in the United States, you are beginning to see platforms that are converging, where everything is converging. Not only do they provide the video link, which is for video remote interpreting, but they also have the database of interpreters. They're using artificial intelligence to be able to assign interpreters based on their language combination, specialties, and their physical location, where they are. And so all of these things that in the past may have been separate applications are now being converged into one platform to be able to offer an end-to-end -end service. That's what I mean when I say convergence. Think for a moment about how that could affect us. All right, we'll move on now and take a look at some of the types of technology. And I want you just to get a, a framework about how you can think about these different technologies. So I've divided interpreting technology or Terp Tech into four categories. Originally, when I came up with this uh, nomenclature, this, this framework, uh, I only had three. But I've added a fourth, and I'll explain why in just a moment. The first one is the one that we are concerned about today. Changing or expanding interpreting delivery. Remote distance interpreting, right? Either, re either remote or distance. This allows us to be able to offer our services in new ways and to reach new clientele. There are also new technologies that are being worked on, particularly in the conference interpreting space here in Europe, to provide us with ready access to terminology, to be able to organize our terminology for us in an interface that works very well in the booth, right? As opposed to just having some glossary program or spreadsheets or the kinds of things that have been done for, for uh, computer-assisted translation over the years. These are specifically things for us. There are also some rather Star Trek-y uh, technologies or applications that we are seeing some different uh, laboratories or universities experimenting with. Speech to text and speech recognition in the last 18 months have made enormous leaps forward. So if you think about being able to have a speech to text of the original speech showing up on a screen in front of you and being able to then connect that to a uh, previously aligned corpus that with your working languages where it can identify terminology and then display it on the screen in the source and the target language within a matter of seconds or a split second or recognizing numbers and placing the numbers in nice big letters on the screen in front of us. Those are things that could be very, very helpful. We're not there yet, but some of the initial tests seem quite promising. This is the one that we don't like. That's why it's in red. 
replacing human interpreters altogether. Artificial intelligence. Now, the key thing to understand with artificial intelligence is that it is artificial. It is not human by definition. And if I can wax philosophical for just a moment, one of the things that has continued to puzzle me over the years that I've been watching the developments in the AI space is that those who focus on artificial intelligence tend to be specialists in the pure sciences, mathematics. Now, we have other sciences like economics, sociology, but they are not known as the pure sciences. The interesting reason why is that they entail the study of human behavior. And they are extremely unpredictable. So I find it, as I said, odd, sometimes perplexing to think that you have teams of pure scientists making use of mathematics to try and decipher human interaction and communication. There's a, there's a disconnect there on a philosophical level, and my sense is that there's a disconnect there as well on a technical level. Because they see the brain as a network of connections. You turn one on, you turn one off, and if we can get enough of the connections, we can then have an artificial intelligence that is capable of having the same number of connections as a human brain. And if there is nothing more to human cognition than turning switches on and off and processing large amounts of data, then the theory goes we should be able to reach human parity with general AI. The reality is that we are nowhere even close to general AI. And Again, I do not see that happening anytime soon. But it is there, and there are many me different gizmos and apps that are trying to do this, and some can actually be somewhat useful in specific cases, but nothing at the level that we're talking about with conference interpreting. Finally, you have this fourth one that I've added, which is the improvement of interpreting workflow management. I talked about overhead and being able to bring down costs. This is an area where this can be done. And it's being applied more and more on different platforms for the simple reason that interpreting, the need for interpreting is expanding tremendously. But what often keeps it from being employed by people who need it is one, the logistical difficulty in making sure you get the right interpreter to the right assignment as fast as possible, and the associated costs that come along with that. So to the extent that you can use artificial intelligence and you can use databases and you can use workflow management platforms to help bring that down, taking it from the moment that an assignment is actually made by a client and following it all the way through to completion and the paperwork to have the invoice issued and to have payment provided and also to provide 360 degree feedback on the client and on the interpreter that provided the service, that's a good thing. And this is happening now. I haven't necessarily seen um, there are some product offerings on the market today from the private sector for interpreting workflow management, but there aren't as many as you would see with translation workflow management, for example. So these are the four. For the purposes of remote interpreting and, and for what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, I like to divide remote or distance interpreting into three categories. Two of these categories are not ones that we'll be focusing on, but I've put these up here because these three acronyms and these three names are the ones that are slowly beginning to gain currency in the discussions that are taking place in the private sector. If we were to compare these to the academic research that has been done and the efforts by, for example, Andrew Constable and, and others, 
you'll find that there are many, many more types of distance interpreting. But again, this is the shorthand that is being used more and more within the private market among business people. You have over the phone, which is, as you would imagine, actually a very, very large portion of the overall interpreting that goes on in the world. Some have put the valuation of, on a yearly basis, of the over the phone market at around $1 billion. Video remote, this I'm referring to consecutive. Okay, so this is to provide on one of these right here or on some other tablet or another screen, have an interpreter come into an interpreted interaction. Usually the interlocutors are in the same physical space and only interp the interpreter is remote, but that is changing with the advent of telemedicine where the care provider and the patient are no longer in the phys physically in the same space. So the interpreter is then connected to that bridge and they're able to interpret. So you have all three in different places. So that's what video remote is. And most of the time in the private sector, if they say VRI, they're referring mainly to the medical and consecutive. A Couple of interesting things about remote interpreting, and this is one of the things that is frustrating a lot of the video providers even when video remote interpreting is used, or video just even with, um, with telemedicine, very often the patients and the doctors don't want to turn their cameras on, and they just use audio. Can any of you think why that may be? Any thoughts? I'll go ahead and repeat it so that the web stream can hear. Privacy? Shame? You guys have gone very philosophical very quickly. I was just thinking, like, my hair's messed up. <laughs> yes, and for the, for the doctors that are often taking these calls, well, no, they may, be at a, they may be at their child's soccer game, and so they just run into the car and they, they turn their phone on, and they don't have an appropriate background, right? So... Sound familiar? Many of the things that we're worried about, the whole issue of interpreting from a home office that is, for many, it's like, oh, I don't want to do that. Uh, other professions are dealing with the same issues as we are. Then, of course, you have RSI, or Remote Simultaneous Interpretation, which is our concern for this meeting. Let me quickly mention one of the things that I feel is important when we talk about Remote Simultaneous. There are lots of qualifiers and adjectives that we put at the beginning of interpreting to explain the kind of interpreting it is, where it takes place, the topic that's being discussed, all of those things. I like to keep this with remote simultaneous and not put conference in there because the simultaneous modality is growing very quickly outside of conference interpreting for the reasons that you would suppose. People don't like waiting that long. Consecutive is still used a great deal in medical. It's still used in the courts, but simultaneous is used in the courts a lot. And simultaneous is used more and more in medical settings. So I think it would be better to just refer to simultaneous, the modality, and not, say, conference and remote conference interpreting because simultaneous being provided at a distance happens not only with conference interpreting, but with many other types or flavors of interpreting as well. Okay, so we've defined our terms. Let's move on to remote interpreting. I've got another interesting quote here from a uh, forward thinker by the name of Michael Saylor. Um, has been very successful in technology, runs the Saylor Academy out of uh, Washington, DC. Um, and I ran into this quote probably six or seven years ago, and it really struck me. It says, if a new thing is technically feasible and is far more economical than the old thing, then the new thing will happen sooner or later. The economic uh, considerations of this statement are huge, not only for us, but for all sorts of other activities where they're seeking to bring down the cost. 
Okay, so here we go. Get out your phones. Those of you who are online, those of you who are watching the web stream, get your phones out. 21, 51, 6. And I'm going to switch over here again. And we'll move on to the next thing here. So I want to ask you this question. It's just finish this statement with the first things that come into your mind, okay? Be honest with yourself. I have the profanity filter on, so if you really are being honest um, and let your guard down, I think I will catch it so that it doesn't show up. Let's see, where did it go? Come on, there it is. Here we go. Remote interpreting is dot, dot, dot. What is it for you? Go ahead and take a minute just to fill that out. And I'm going to see if I can get my other presentation up. Take a look and see what's showing up there. Is this today? Yes, that's the one. So let's see what's coming up now. Challenging. Look at that big, big word there in the middle. Isn't that the truth? The future, I think, is coming in second place. Other things coming up. Just keep them coming in. Keep them coming in. We had about 57 people on the other one. Now, I, I have found my correct presentation, so I may need one of the technicians just to come up here and help me make the switch over. If so, that would be very helpful. I'm also seeing words like scary, scary, exciting. I like that, that combination. It's positive and negative. Come on up. So this is the presentation that I need to have up there. And I haven't closed the other one, but you can do that. Tricky, stressful. Yes, that's the one, but I'm going to switch back over. I'll tell you about this car in just a minute. Yes, but you can go down to, yeah, right there. That's fine. And then switch. I just need to get back over to here. There we go. Stressful, tiring, useful, a reality, new, comfortable, convenient, disruptive, exhausting, a necessary evil. Okay. Working in pajamas. I have to be honest. I've been working out of my home now for about, I have a home studio for about two and a half years. There was an assignment where I did work with pajama bottoms on. I did have on a tie and a shirt and you only saw me from here up. <laughs> but I don't normally do that, but that, that did work out that way that day. So if we look at this, this here, I'm, I've been asking groups of interpreters for about a year and a half this very question. And I can tell you some of them have not been this positive. This is a very forward-thinking and forward-looking group. So I congratulate you on that. But you're not turning a blind eye to the difficulties that are there with interpreting. Now, if you'll bear with me for just one moment as I move on, because I want to tell you just a quick story. OK, here we go. Now let me make sure that this is working the way it should. Oh, and there that is, but that's, let's see. So what I need is actually that slide right now. I 
and thank you for your patience. As he's working to get that other slide up, let me just quickly mention, this is a photo that I took yesterday. I had the opportunity to go see one of my former students. Uh, she's actually Italian, um, has been working, I think, on the European market now for a number of years. She's probably graduated five years ago or something. Um, and when she found out I was coming to Rome, she said, Barry, why don't you come and I'll show you um, where it is that I, I grew up. And so we went and we were in the city. Oh, there it is. I'll have to finish telling that story in just a moment. Okay, we're getting around. Um, let's see. I'm not sure if this is the same slide. If you want to go down, let's make sure it's the right. If you can go down and find the... Uh, that one it. That's the slide I want, yes. These ones? Yes, but I don't think that that is, this isn't the deck that I want though, so we should probably close that out. And this one. So the way I'll tell is if it's got the, uh, the where did that go? Because I had the, that's not the one. Let's close it out and I'll open, close that one as well. Now let's open that one right there. Yes. The one, current state of affairs of the first, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can go to page seven there and then I'll move on through. Okay, okay. so let's see, is it moving now? Ah, oh, there we are. There's the car. So, um, so this is in the uh, the town of uh, Orvieto, which I had never seen before in my life. Amazing for someone who's not from Italy. There was a picture on every corner. I was having such a wonderful time, and I thought that this was a quintessential image of Italy. All right, up close. But if you look at this, you wouldn't know where it was taken. It could be in any place in Italy. And this is what I wanted to show you at the beginning, talking about the big picture. After we went around Orvieto and I was able to go see the Duomo and all of the other wonderful architecture there, my friend took me in a car, my former student, and we drove over to a hill where we were able to see the city at a distance. With all of the information I've shared with you thus far, what I'm seeking to do is to have you look at this whole issue with a different perspective. Far too often we get engrossed in the specifics of our daily work. And we don't take the time to step back a little bit and say what is really happening on a grander scale. And these two pictures did it for me. This picture is beautiful, it's wonderful, I love it. I put it on Instagram. I have so many friends who said, this is so cool, what a great shot. But there's so much more to be seen. And that's what I'm hoping at the end of our weekend, we're gonna walk out of here with a lot of more information for us to be able to make informed decisions that are gonna help move our own personal practice forward and also the profession, because we have a place in the 21st century, a very important place. So let's get back now. We all had our, our, our questions here. I'll move through these quickly, get where we need to be. Now, this is what I wanted to show you. This is an exercise that I did with end users of interpreting services. I spoke at a conference early last year where all of the people that were in attendance had to work with interpreters on a fairly regular basis. I just changed the question a little bit. Working with interpreters is. Challenging, frustrating, difficult, time consuming, stressful, slow, intimidating, awkward, necessary. Then we did have wonderful, enjoyable, helpful, a great help, a blessing. Hazy, awkward, expensive. So 
Remember that thing about perspective we were just talking about? Something for us to keep in mind. If we truly hope to have our services seen as indispensable and important in the future, it's not just about what we want. It's about what everyone in the communicative process needs. This was a real eye-opener for me. And it made me remember that we, at the end of the day, provide a service. And however we are able to provide that service with greater ease for the end user, the better off we are going to be. Now, with the caveat that there are certain things we have to have in order to do our job. So I want to make that sure. This doesn't mean that we suddenly become you know, so flexible we bend over backwards at everything that they ask us to do. No. But we need to keep all the other members in mind in this entire process. So talking about where distance interpreting is right now. There's a well-known poem, at least in English, in the United States by a poet named Robert Frost. And it starts, two roads diverged in the yellow wood. I'm not going to recite the entire poem at this point, but I think it's an apt way to start this discussion because what I have seen in the last two years is a significant and growing bifurcation in the kind of technology being used for distance interpreting. So what's the first road? These are what I call highly engineered remote simultaneous interpreting solutions. This is where you have usually internal cable, you may have closed circuit television, um, the interpreters are all working in booths. In fact, I know that many of you are gonna recognize this photo. Some of you have seen this photo before. Some of you may have actually even been working there for all I know. Does anybody know where this photo is from? <laughs> Got a hand there in the back from our interpreter. She's probably saying Hampton Court. You can nod your head if that's right. This is from Hampton Court. For the European market and for the European Commission, this was the earthquake that started it all. I'm not gonna tell you that because I have a quiz coming up a little bit later, but I will tell you after the quiz. Hampton Court, there wasn't room in the building for all of the booths, and as I've heard the different stories from interpreters, they didn't want the booths in this beautiful historic building messing up the view. But when I say highly engineered, you can see just what this took. They actually had to build a tent to put the booths in. All the booths were put in, and you have multiple screens, you have four different views, and the interpreters are all able to see that, and the technicians that have to keep track of all of this information and all of this technology. Now, this is more or less what the de facto technical standard has become, for these kinds of events within the European Commission. But if you think about this for an organizer of a smaller meeting, this would be very, very difficult, extremely expensive to replicate. In fact, it's extremely expensive to do even for the institutions. But it is being used more and more. And there are other conferences where this happens. I worked in a remote circumstance just a couple of weeks ago um, at the Organization of American States. We were just in a room adjacent to a very large conference room where they were having a session. Um, I had a Latin American president who had come to speak. And we saw the people going into the room, but we had a large screen in front of us. We were not in the room anymore. They needed the chairs. They wanted that space for people to be able to attend. So this is something that is set up and is used quite regularly. Other places, such as the World Bank, have implemented remote solutions that are highly engineered, very good, where they're able to send interpreting from booths in room, in 
meeting rooms that are not being utilized and they can be sent to other places and the audio is then received by the listeners there and the interpreters are able to have a live video feed. Seeing more and more of these in the international organizations. But this is just one type. Let's go on to the second, which is cloud-based remote simultaneous interpreting solutions. And I'm trying to see how I'm doing time-wise. I've got until, got about 40 minutes. Yeah, it's going to go quickly. So cloud-based. This is my interpreting studio in my home. This is in my home office. I built this because I wanted to be able to work from my home office. I also teach sometimes from my home office. And I took uh, quite a bit of time to design what I needed and what I wanted. To walk you through this just quickly, uh, this is a sit-stand desk that is, has an electric motor that allows me to stand or sit based on what I want to do. Um, it's actually very nice. I'm a big guy. I have never fit well in those boxes back there. The booth has never really been my friend. I've hit my head a lot of times on doors going in and out. Um, the chairs that are used rarely have the lumbar support that I need. Um, I'm working at hotels. I'm not working at, uh, I was a staff interpreter for several years, but I work basically as an independent, a freelance interpreter. And we get hotel chairs. I'm much more comfortable, I know that's actually quite dark. I'm much more comfortable sitting in a nice chair in my office. And if I need to stand up, I can stand up. If I want to sit down, I can sit down. I've got two screens. One so I can have the video. The other allows me to look at slides if there are slides. Um, I also have a video camera hooked up with this as well because sometimes people want to see the interpreter. Um, and I also have what you can't necessarily see here, but I have a wired ethernet connection that has gigabit speeds. So I'm connected actually with a fiber optic connection where I have um, one gigabit you know, it's very fast. And so it works well. But it took time to put all that together and it took investment. Now, recognizing, and this is something that I also discovered when I began hiring interpreters to do distance interpreting jobs uh, on different platforms, that construction is different everywhere. And here I think probably in Rome, many of you may have apartments with very high ceilings and probably hard floors. And the audio bounces all over the place. Something we ran into when I was hiring people in Brazil. They finally said, is there just a place where we can go and do this? Because I can't do it from my home. It's too noisy. The windows are usually open. Sirens, you know, firemen go by. It doesn't work. So there are conditions that you have to have to be able to do this here. What I'm seeing is that there is a real push to create interpreting hubs, if you will. And uh, of course, uh, this is a picture of one of the hubs that a company has built. Um, I actually had the opportunity to work at this hub. Um, and it is in an ISO standard booth. The technology is all taken care of by the technician of the company. And it works very well. So for those interpreters who do not want to work at home, this is something that we're seeing more and more of. These hubs are being set up in larger metropolitan areas where you have interpreters that will be able to work here without having to stay in a hotel or anything like that. So this is what we're seeing for cloud-based solutions. When I say cloud-based, they're making use of the shared infrastructure of the internet to be able to uh, provide the service. Um, I know that many interpreters, when they hear that, they start to think of all sorts of issues like confidentiality. Um, also, when you're working from a home studio, what happens if the power goes out or if there's an internet problem? All of those concerns, am I going to be responsible for that? Um, those are all very fair questions. And as I've posed them to different people working in industry, they say all of that is easy to address through a contract to stipulate who's responsible for what. And so those are not barriers that are insurmountable. They need to be addressed, but they're not insurmountable. 
these are the kinds of, of uh, jobs that we're seeing interesting growth with, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute when we get to market expansion. But just understand that you have these two options within the cloud-based solutions, going to a, uh, a hub or a studio or setting something up in your own home if that's something that you want to do. But I recognize that is not for everyone. Ice cream, I've always loved ice cream. These are just some of the flavors that are out there of distance interpreting, and I don't have all of them mentioned. And so it is extremely important when someone asks you to do a distance interpreting job that you are able to discover what those things are, right? Is it video remote interpreting? Will it be with multiple screens? Are you going to be interpreting for a virtual meeting where everyone is distributed and no one is physically in the same space? Is it going to be on a conference call where no one can see each other, it's just audio? Those happen as well. Um, teleconference, is it going to be someone that is being brought into a meeting? There are all sorts of considerations for that. So I want to take a moment here and share some technical stuff with you. I promise not to geek out too much as I talk about this, but it's really important that we start to understand some of these concepts. I want to talk to you about frequency response. And frequency response is important for us as interpreters because depending on the frequencies that are available that a system can replicate, we will be able to understand the language better or worse. So quickly here, human vocal range basically goes from about 50 hertz all the way up to about 17,000 hertz or 17 um, kilohertz. This is human vocal range, okay? This upper level here, you and I probably don't hit it ever, ever in our lives. Good opera singers, on the other hand, they're the ones that get up into that range. We don't. Same thing with a, uh, with a wonderful bass that would be down here. Human speech approximately goes from about uh, 50 hertz, or excuse me, 80 hertz, um, to 8,000 and beyond, depending on the language and some of the consonant sounds. But the vast majority of the resonant frequencies are actually down in this area here. Let me show you three different audio standards. The G711 and the G729, these are codecs that were approved many, many years ago at the International Telecommunication Union. And this is what we have on regular telephones today. We only are able to perceive on the telephone this small slice of human speech. The rest of the time, what do we have to do? We have to guess, based on context, what the sound actually was. All right, was it a d or was it a t? Was it a s or was it a sh? We don't know, our, our ears are not picking that up on a regular telephone. Now, um, m several years back, a new standard was adopted, which is G722 and G7221. This is also referred to as wideband HD audio in the private sector, right? You'll often hear that your phone is capable of HD voice. This expands significantly the frequency response that's available on um, any device that's able to reproduce this, okay? And it basically goes from 50 hertz uh, up to 7 or 7.5 um, kilohertz, which is a huge improvement if you compare the two. The last one I'll show you here is the current ISO standard for simultaneous interpretation sound. If I got that right, Klaus? It's got, it, they've raised it to 15 now. Okay, this was previous. I'm not a member of ISO, and so I don't have access to the, to the working documents and what you guys have been doing. But it goes up to 15. Here is where Klaus and I have a difference of opinion. 1,500, in my opinion, is not necessary. 
Is it great? Yes. If we can have it, totally want it. But this works. Now, we could get into to more technical issues and we could look at, at what the curve is and how things begin to drop off when you drop below a certain level. How many inferences, how many guesses, how many ambiguities, ambiguities do you have to deal with um, at these different levels? But the difference between the number of ambiguities that you hear with this, vis-a-vis -vis this, is minimal. So what I am saying is that if you look at just the numbers, working with this codec and this frequency response will be more fatiguing, a little bit. But if you work with this, this is what most telephonic interpreters, over-the-phone interpreters work with on a daily basis. It is fatiguing because the number of ambiguities is significant compared to these other two, okay? Um, I hope this is really helpful, and if it hasn't made sense or you're still confused, please feel free. I'm happy to talk more about it during the break. But understanding this right here is key to the development of the technologies that, is going, that are going on today. What I envisage in the future is that this codec is going to improve and it's going to continue to go up. Okay. Market development. Here we're expanding our thoughts here again. And I want you to um, just think about the, these numbers for a minute, okay? This number is from one mainstream web conferencing platform. In the last year, they had 45 plus billion video conferencing minutes. Now you're thinking 45 billion, wow, that's a lot. But I don't think we can necessarily wrap our head around what that actually means if it's presented in minutes. So let's do some math. That's equal to 750 million video conferencing hours in one year. For reference, there are only 8,760 hours in a year. So if we do a little more math, that's 85,616.5, I round it up just a little, years of video conferencing that took place on one mainstream video conferencing platform in one year. Let's just for the sake of argument and to move forward with a thought experiment. What if just 1%, 1% of that traffic was interpreted? That would be 856 years of interpreting work. Now, 1% is actually quite a bit. I think we're, we, even if it were a quarter of a percent, the thing is, on the mainstream platforms, there is no way currently to be able to provide simultaneous interpretation in a professional manner for many of the types of meetings that are taking place. But if we are able to have platforms that are able to make it into the mainstream with multi-channel audio and simultaneous interpretation functions, which it would be distance or remote, think about how that could expand access to our services. Now, this is crystal ball gazing. I accept that. I admit it. But I want to give you just a little bit of vision of what could be if we are able to make it so. This next graph I'm going to show you, um, unfortunately the letters are quite small, but uh, hopefully you can see this. Um, two months ago, I reached out to a number of remote interpreting companies, all cloud-based, and I asked them to provide me with one statistic. Please send me 
the number of meetings, or um, what I called them were, were interpreted events on your platforms in 2016, 2017, and 2018 through August 31st, okay? Um, out of all of those that I approached, four gave me their data. So this is not an exhaustive study. This is a small snapshot of four companies that are providing remote interpreting services or cloud interpreting services. I then took the data and I asked them to provide the number of uh, events in four categories. The first is over the phone consecutive, but this is not consecutive like you're thinking where it is for immigrant communities, for doctors, that these interactions tend to last 10 to 15 minutes at the most. This is what I call high value consecutive, where in order to be successful, the interpreter needs to have training with notes, and these interactions last anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours. And they're usually between high value participants that are looking at getting information for due diligence in the private market, as well as market research, okay? Next category, um, audio only simultaneous, no video. Next category, webinars with simultaneous interpretation. And then finally, web conferences with simultaneous interpretation. So these are the four categories, and you'll notice that we have an outlier. The blue line is doing something very different. Now, to be fair, you have to remember that the 2018 number is only through August. So in all honesty, I think if I were to go back in January and ask them for the final Q4 numbers, that all of these uh, numbers, everything, simul, webinars, and web conferences, all of that would be trending upward. But not very quickly. This is organic, limited organic growth. And this is not the growth that we need to get to the other numbers that I had mentioned previously. It's good growth, we'll take it, we want it, but if we compare it to what's happened here with this consecutive, they're growing very, very quickly, all right? Um, doubling almost, yes. Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I, I could only speculate, to be honest. Oh, and let me just quickly say, Urosh had just asked, is there any indication as to what language pairs? And the answer is no. I only requested that very general statistic and promised all of these companies that I would not be divulging um, the companies or, or any of the clients or any of that additional information. So I just have this one data point. Um, the difference that I see in these things between these bottom three and this one is that th these calls, these interpreted events are taking place on existing general infrastructure, meaning they're using mainstream platforms that the end clients request. They say, we'll just use that platform. Wh whatever platform you use, we'll provide the interpreter. Okay? And so, because of that, I think we're seeing this kind of growth. So there is a challenge out there right now to be able to introduce the remote simultaneous in that we need to show that these, this new model is viable and give clients a reason to move from an existing platform that doesn't offer simultaneous to one that does. Now, that's not necessarily our job as interpreters. That's the company's job, right? But this is one of the things that I honestly feel at this time, oop, let me go back, I went too far. Sorry about that, hit the wrong button. This limited growth, I think in part has to do with that. I'm hoping that in the coming years, it's gonna be more like the blue line. Okay. There we go. Here's what I wanted to show you. An interpreted event is one 
where a remote interpreter is hired and they interpret. It could be a day, it could be a week, it could be 45 minutes. However, I think I will say this, that I don't think that these events here are um, you know, days-long events. There could be some mixed in there, but my uh, experience and in talking with a lot of these platforms is that the um, events that are interpreted like this tend to be shorter in nature because um, sitting in front of a computer screen for three days isn't all that attractive to a lot of people. And I don't think that's going to change. I think this just indicates that there's going to be a new way that we're delivering. We shouldn't be thinking in terms of days necessarily. Yeah. And your son is, I'm sure, in a millennial, the millennial generation. The comment was, my son th thinks otherwise, that there will be uh, times where we'll spend days and days in front of a screen. We'll have to see how it plays out. I don't think we have enough data to say Yes. Um, which of these lines would include real events with people being at oh, a conference great question. Mm -hmm. and the interpreter at home or yeah. in a hub? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I'm going to, how can I put this? Um, respectfully um, disagree with uh, calling these, saying that these aren't real events. They are real for the people that are on them. But I do understand what you mean. Yes. It's a question of virtual or face-to-face. Face-to-face. Um, none of these, this is all new market. None of these interpreted events, and over the last three, almost three years, two years and three quarters, there was a grand total of 4,413 interpreted events. Which is, from our point of view, that's, that's quite a few comes out to 138 a month. Now, this does not take into account any of the um, highly engineered remote interpreting events that I talked about in that first group. This is all cloud-based interpreting, and it does not include any events where the interpreters were remote and the participants were on site, okay? So nothing was replaced here. This is all new. Does that answer your question? Doesn't. Well, maybe I didn't understand your question. Please rephrase it. I want to make sure I've answered. Um, I was asking about conferences where everybody yes. is there, only the interpreter is somewhere else. Yes. Mm -hmm. where, where would that fit? You, you haven't included yeah. these. None of these events here include anything like that. So it, no, uh, do those you, kinds Do you have a statistic on this? I do not because all of the platforms that responded are not providing that kind of work. Okay. Okay. There are others that do, I recognize, of course. The, the reason I've, I'm asking is because that would be our market Mm -hmm. And we would be interested in knowing how fast it is being replaced by a different kind of... <laughs> I'm interested in knowing that as well. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I'm very interested. But again, this was an initial study, and it was entirely up to the, uh, the platforms to participate or not. I reached out to platforms that provide all sorts of services, and this is what I received. So I think there are a couple of more comments or questions there in the back. I think the mic's coming. Who's the first? Oh, please. Thank you. Oh, goodness. Any explanation to the webinar trend? I see it's going down, unlike the other uh, um, methods. Again, I think it could be a bit of a blip uh, because you still have the fourth quarter to go. And webinars tend to pick up after August as well. Okay. So I think you may see this rise again. Um, one of the other things I've noticed with webinars is that some end clients, what they want to do is they're not averse to doing something uh, with multiple languages. In fact, they need to do it in multiple languages. But sometimes their offices are, they need English for North America, maybe French, then they need French, German, Hungarian for uh, Europe, but then they need Korean and Japanese and Chinese. And trying to do a webinar live for all those languages across all of those um, time zones is problematic. 
And so what some have done, and it's not a trend that helps us, but it is what's happening, is they say, okay, we'll do it in English, and then we'll just send it out afterwards and we'll have it subtitled. And then we'll ship it to all the offices and they can see it in about a month. So that's another trend that we're seeing um, with the webinars. If this is going to hold true in the coming years, I don't know. There's going to need to be more data collected. But good question. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your very interesting presentation. And, um, well, thank you. Um, I'm Levan, by the way. And um, I think I'm going to be asking this question, um, well, more often these two days. Uh, the question is basically, uh, what's in it for us? Because new technology, I realized it there, and I realized that there are people who want to harness it and uh, provide, well, service, uh, largely, as I see, at our expense, because our, our work becomes, uh, well, less convenient. Uh, yeah, we will have to cope with challenges and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we will have to uh, cope with uh, competition from the parts of the world mm -hmm. which were closed uh, by, by, by geographics. Mm -hmm. So when, when we are talking about this, my, my opinion is that we shouldn't be only considering the technical part of the question, but also the um, commercial part of the question, uh, socio-economic part of the question, because this profession will become less attractive to, to many of uh, people who are used to certain standards, certain um, things in this profession. Mm -hmm. So the question is uh, basically what's in it for us? Yeah. Or, or is it just that if you don't do, you, um, you don't work anymore? So I don't think it's going to come to that in our lifetimes at all. Um, but that's a, that's a fair question to ask. What is in it for us? And yes, go ahead. While I have the mic, can I just try to answer what I think AIC's role should be in this is technology in itself is neither positive nor negative. It's not good or bad. It has pros and cons. That discussion is about our business model. Whether we are willing to accept being paid by the hour or by the minute, simply because we are online for five minutes or 25 or two, two hours and, f and five minutes. Does that mean that that's the only time we're busy for that assignment? Doesn't that include preparation time and lots of other things that should also be factored in when we quote and bill? Yes. But that's another issue. We're not talking technology. We're talking business models. And, and make no mistake, these technologies are changing our business models. And they will have, they're having, they're exerting pressure on our business models now. Um, the vast majority of end users of these services have no concept of why we want a day rate. They bill for all other professional services by the hour. Why would this be any different? Yeah, well, we should. And we should also ask ourselves. Are we married to the day rate? Should the day rate always be what we do? Can we not change? I mean, I, I think, for example, if they're willing to pay me you know, several hundred dollars an hour, or euro, OK. They want to pay me 100 euros a minute? I'll work for five minutes, right? So we have to make sure that we don't mix apples with oranges, but these things are definitely important. I know my time is quickly running to a close. And I'm nowhere near the end of my slides, which is what always happens. But I'm not going to rush through them quickly. Um, maybe during the break or at some other time. Now, let's go ahead and do this. This is going to be fun. So get those phones out, folks. Oh, what happened there? Oh, there it is. Here we go. Yes. So if you want to join, this is a quiz. I've got three questions. Join as quickly as you can. Letting a few more people join before we start question number one. The person who gets the most right answers the fastest wins. And I have a small gift, a very small gift, from California for the winner. No, it's not wine. I'm sorry. But it's still good. It could go well with wine. OK, we've got a few more others that are joining online. You can join us for the quiz as well, although I can't give you the gift from California if you win. 
Okay, we'll go with 39 and get started. Oh, 41, a few more joining. 46, 47, 48. We'll get started. Here's question number one. Get ready. When the first patent for simultaneous interpretation equipment was granted, what was it called? Look at your phones. Got 15 seconds left to answer. You're taking a long time. Okay, we've got a lot of folks answering. Four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, telephonic interpretation system, speech translating system. 26 of you got it right. In the original patent filed with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, this is what it was called, a speech translating system, much to our chagrin. Next question. All right, let me find out where we are. Oh, let's, let's see the leaderboard. Let's see. Dun, 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 dun. We've got Jan is on top with 830 points. Start question two. Here we go. When was the earliest documented mention of remote interpreting? Look at your phones. 1963, 1957, 1972, or 1980? Eight seconds. Two, one, zero. 1957. If you want to check that, you can read Franz Pohacker's um, um, Interpreting Studies Reader. It's referenced there. 1957. And they said something along the lines of, this is a technology and a mode that should be uh, further studied for its convenience or something like that. All the way back in the 50s. All right, so let's see who's leading now. Ooh. Wolfmeister is now ahead with 816 or 1582 points. We go into our last question. In what year did the European Commission undertake its first remote interpreting project at Hampton Court, London? This is why I didn't want to share the date with you earlier. <laughs> Five seconds. Okay, many of you knew. 2005. 13 years ago. So let's see who won. Oh, now where are we? All right, it looks like Wolfmeister has won with 2,503 points. Who's Wolfmeister? <laughs> See me after when we go to break, and I'll give you your prize. Okay, thanks for that. I thought that might be fun. No, it's a small. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to, let's see, I'm looking for Stefano. We've got about five minutes. Okay. I want to get through some current use cases. These are all documented use cases, OK? How much? OK. Current use cases, audio conferencing with simultaneous interpretation. All of these pins represent where participants were located, OK? This is an audio call that actually originated out of Africa in French and English. Interpreters were located on two continents. The US and France were the countries where they were. And the participants were across Africa, Southeast Asia, and also in Europe. Okay, the call lasted for about two hours. It was so an advisory panel that had to meet based on statutory requirements, had to meet once a quarter, but they only had budget for one face-to-face -face meeting a year. But they still had to meet. 
and they needed to do it in English and French because they had non, they had Francophone uh, participants from Africa who spoke no English. Okay, so there's one. Here's another one, a multilingual webinar. This I believe was a com was a uh, originated out of Europe as well. I think it was out of Germany, and they interpreted into from German. I think it was into English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And they had participants in Australia, Europe, North America, and South America. Okay? I think they were presenting a report that this organization had published about something that had to do with Latin America. Here's another one. Just a simple bilateral virtual meeting between the US government and the Mexican government to discuss border issues. Many of the, sp the people um, doing this virtual meeting, it included screen share, um, video capability, and remote simultaneous interpretation between English and Spanish so that the experts could discuss the issues at hand. These meetings are taking place you know, two or three times a month with this client. Face-to-face -face meeting with RSI. This is the one that is eating into the way we used to work, or we still work, right? Um, the meeting was actually in Japan. It was a, um, an association that had its headquarters in Europe, and the interpreters were actually based in London. Okay? And they had multiple languages, including Japanese. And if I'm not mistaken, um, some of the interpreters were on site, others were, were remote. Again, looking at bringing down overhead in terms of travel and lodging. I really would like to do a study and know a lot more about what's going on here, but I will tell you that the companies are becoming more and more close hold with their clients and their information because there is a lot of competition going on. Oh, VRI in legal settings, this is video remote interpreting that includes both simultaneous and consecutive. In the legal sphere in the United States, remote interpreting is a very complex issue, but it has been implemented in both modes with the very hardware heavy applications, large screens, lots of, of uh, equipment that you need to babysit and make sure it works. And there are others that are introducing um, solutions that are much more flexible and that can be portable and taken from one court to another. If you think about, I actually got a call um, not long ago from uh, the courts in Alaska, which is a very, very large state. And they can't send interpreters to all the courts. And they are dealing not you know, with Spanish, because there are Spanish speakers up there, but they're dealing with indigenous languages as well. And being able to send a court qualified interpreter from Anchorage, say, to Yukon, or you know, some of these other places, it's, it's really, really difficult to head all the way up to the north coast or other parts. So they have to find ways to do this. But using simultaneous and consecutive, and they have the additional complication that they need to allow counsel and client to be able to have interpreted sidebar conversations without the rest of the court hearing. It's complex, but it's being resolved. And there are systems that are, that are doing this now. Okay, fifth, OPI and VRI in healthcare. We've talked about that a little bit. It's expanding in the United States, again, with that one caveat that they're not turning on their video as much. It's, it's interesting that that's the case, but it is growing. Uh, finally, interpreter training. I want to mention this because if new interpreters are learning the skills online, it makes sense that they're going to say, I'm happy to work online. I've been training interpreters online for the last two years, um, and it's going well. Is it perfect? No. But one of the things that I am seeing, I used to worry greatly about the platforms I was using, and if there was any technical problem, that it would be problematic and I would end up um, having a lot of complaints. What I've discovered is that I'm usually able to resolve most of the problems myself, as opposed to having a technician come in that has to look at, at physical equipment. All of this is now residing in the cloud. It's virtual. So, um, and this is with multi-channel audio. And also, um, 
these pins that I have here, I've rearranged a little bit because this represents, I'm happy to say, where the participants were for the most recent IEEC training seminar that took place in Washington, DC. We had remote participants, we had seven. We had three in California, three in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and one in Addis Ababa. And it worked really well. I'll show you a quick picture here. You can see Franz Pohacker there standing next to them. We've got the video screen with all of the remote participants. All of the on-site participants can see the remote participants. They're able to talk. Um, the little ping pong balls you see hanging down from the ceiling are omnidirectional microphones so that no one had to be mic'd. Not appropriate if there were interpretation. But in this scenario, it worked very well. Um, I'm happy to say that we have collected data on this because we did two workshops, one with remote participants, the second workshop, no remote participants, only on site, no video or anything else, and we sent out questionnaires and I heard back from Franz that everybody answered. We're going to be crunching the data and the comments and looking forward to publishing what we've discovered to see what people think about the experience as they were learning. So it was a, a great experiment, but I see a lot of potential to be able to increase uh, the training that is needed for trainers and for individual interpreters by making use of this kind of technology. So one other picture, we took a class photo. Now, you may be feeling like this young girl right here trying to take a drink. I've given you a lot of information. And a lot of it's probably just gone by like this. I don't want you to feel frustrated, but sometimes it can feel like overload. Um, this is really, really, it, it's a complex subject, and there are many things that I haven't even touched on. But where do we go from here? One more quote. This is from Nicholas Carr, another author and, uh, and innovator. He said, when applications have no physical form, when they can be delivered as digital services over a network, the constraints disappear. This is what we're facing right now. Now, the constraints for him are just being able to deliver the service. We have constraints that we have to work with that we want to make sure remain in place. But the vision of being able to provide remote interpreting is very large and something that can be quite attractive as we move forward. Kai-Fu Li, who is uh, an author, and he worked for Google for many years. He was the head of Google in China, um, has written a book recently about uh, artificial intelligence. And what I've taken from the book thus far, I'm on about chapter four, is this. The innovative part has, has gone, right? We have the technologies now. It's all here. Some of the kinks still will have to be worked out. But he said, this is the age of implementation. And this is why we have to get involved in the conversation. Talking amongst ourselves is fabulous. It's wonderful. We need to do this so that we can have a good idea of where we want to be moving forward. But these systems are being implemented now. And if you'll remember those three things I talked about, replacement, expansion, and then consolidation or convergence, when all of the different pieces converge on the big systems that are going to end up being the leaders in the market, when that happens, it's going to be much more difficult to have any influence on the way that our services are offered through them. That's why now is the time. Now's the time to act. We don't want this. This is a video remote interpreting um, space in a basement for a large healthcare provider in the United States. Healthcare colleagues are going through all sorts of challenges in my country right now because they don't have any best practices in terms of how often they should get breaks, how long are they going to be working, how many interpreted events are they, should they be doing during a day, right? Because there's so much demand, they want to put them all in there. They start at 9 and they just work, 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 lunch, work, 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 work. From a standpoint of efficiency, from the administrators, it's fabulous. But the burnout and the turnover of the interpreters is tremendous, and it's going to be terrible. This is what we don't want for ourselves. 
In order for us to do this, we have to diversify. And this gets at some of the questions that were asked. What's in this for us? I don't see big changes on the horizon for the international organizations or for the European institutions. Will there be change? Yes, there will. But there will still be a lot of the same for the foreseeable future. But for those of us working in the private market, we need to be able to diversify and be able to offer our services in new ways. Because what happens in the private market eventually makes its way into the public, not the other way around. So we have to look at diversification. And I talked to you about this before, and you can see the diversification that's happening now. Lots of pros and cons about this, and we're going to be talking about it, so I'm not going to get into it. But, you know, you look at this and you say expanded access to service, increased efficiency. Um, you have a reduction in the logistical burden. More communication. The more the world communicates, I think the less we're going to shoot at each other. That's a good thing. Less travel, which kind of can be a positive thing. <laughs> Depends on where you stand. That could be a pro, could be a con. Um, we also have degradation of interpreter working conditions. We have to work to make sure that doesn't happen. Feelings of isolation, right? the uberization of the profession that we're worried about. From the client's point of view, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I could just press a button and have it taken care of? That is something really attractive from a client's standpoint. We can't ignore that. We can't laugh at it either. What we have to do is reach a happy medium to help them understand that that's not really possible, particularly when you're dealing with these things that are so important. Um, I'll go ahead and leave that there because I know we're just about out of time. It really comes down for me, we're looking at expansion of service and also replacement. This is happening and it will continue to happen. At what speed, I don't know. But this is where I like to focus my attention because I see opportunity for more interpreters to work. So as we wrap up, very well-known quote from Bill Wood, um, the dean of interpreter uh, console creators. Um, he started in 1973 in California. Still alive today, but he is well retired. He's in his 80s. Um, interpreters will never be replaced by technology. They'll be replaced by interpreters who use technology. And I think I'll go ahead and end right there. Thank you for your attention. Grazie Barry per questa panoramica. Io personalmente, che qualcosa ho letto, Comincio finalmente, dopo averti ascoltato, a capire di più in che mondo, in che universo ci muoviamo. Avremo dopo tempo per il dibattito, quindi non voglio adesso, come dire, la pausa sarà molto breve. Comunque grazie veramente di, queste, di tutte le cose, delle prospettive che ci hai aperto. E certo, il problema è per chi è allergico al gelato. Lì c'è un problema. <ride> Abbiamo una pausa caffè nella sala adiacente. Grazie ancora.